Hi everybody, I am Andy McInnes. Uh, I am the technical instructor for MIT's Integrated Design and Management program. Today's workshop is on fasteners. Fasteners are something that you will no doubt come into contact with, uh, whether you're uh, building your house, build, uh, designing and building products, prototypes, or, or what have you. They, they are everywhere and they truly do hold it all together. For our purposes, I've divided uh, fasteners into two uh, broad categories, uh, threaded uh, versus unthreaded, and then uh, through fitting, uh, through fasteners versus blind fasteners. And I'll go over each uh, combination of these as we go. Um, this, uh, this way of dividing them up may make it easier for you in the future to choose a fastener uh, because th these uh, these categories are um, uh, more related to the situation you find yourself in rather than a, a, uh, an exhaustive uh, uh, treatise on, on fasteners themselves. Okay, so the first category here is blind fasteners and that just means that uh, you only have access to one side of the fastener, one side of the object. Um, and breaking that down further we have uh, blind threaded fasteners and there are also blind unthreaded which we'll go over in a second. Um, so a blind threaded fastener goes through one part uh, and it goes into threads on the second part. So we can see here on this uh, I think it's a bicycle headset part um, the chrome uh, looking bolts on the far right those those screws go through the u-shaped uh, retainer thing and into the larger piece of metal uh, into threads and and perhaps this is not obvious but the uh, the threads on the fasteners must match the threads that are in the material that they are uh, being fastened to. Alright there are uh, lots of different types of fasteners uh, through uh, of all categories that we'll be going over today. Uh, so the blind threaded fastener types are simply uh, what we would commonly call screws. Uh, there are lots of different variations. Uh, in this picture here, starting on the left, we have a shoulder screw, we have a, a socket head button screw, we have cap screws with hex heads, we have round headed screws, um, flat head screws, uh, we have set screws with a socket uh, drive in it, and we have socket head screws that are a cap screw. This is just a, a, uh, a a very small number of the actual choices available, but it's it's a, a good place to start. Uh, so, in order to have threaded fasteners work, you have to tap threads somewhere or create threads uh, in the material that you're using uh, to um, uh, to allow the the threads something to work on to tighten themselves up. Um, another option is having threaded inserts where these these are uh, knurled and rough on the outside, but uh, on the inside, you can see on the top, there's a start of threads. These are threaded all through the middle, and these are used in places like uh, on the image on the right, a piece of plastic, uh, where the plastic itself isn't strong enough to support threads. But when you insert these threaded inserts, uh, in this case, they're probably ultrasonically inserted. Uh, and the, that heats them up slightly and, and allows them to bond to the plastic. So you have a nice hard um, surface for the threads to work against, but you don't have to have the entire object made out of that material. So you, you can make things lighter or stronger or use more appropriate materials where you need to. Uh, another type of blind threaded fastener is if you look on the, the aluminum object here, the uh, on the right the the, uh, the it looks like one of those uh, threaded inserts I just showed you, except uh, because it has threads in the middle. But this one is uh, attached to the piece of aluminum, made separately and attached to a specifically sized hole that was placed in the aluminum. And there's a tool that will put that on there for you. And uh, another type of of flas fasteners is called a rivet nut or riv nut. Uh, and this is uh, is fastened is put on the same way as the previous in the aluminum, where you put it through the hole, and then a tool 
acts on it to uh, make sure that it doesn't come out of, I think this is probably a, a bicycle uh, frame that we're looking at here. Uh, a sort of little three-step animation on how rivet nuts work. You, um, you drill a hole in the material on the far left and you drop in your rivet nut and that's, uh, that's what they look like when you take them out of the box. You insert a threaded tool which compresses from the top to the bottom using the threads on the, thread, on the rivet nut itself. And the next two stages you can see it, it closes that gap and, and it attaches the rivet nut permanently to the piece of material that you, were, uh, that you attached it to. Uh, another type of blind threaded fastener that I'm sure everybody has seen is a screw. Uh, on the left we have uh, bronze wood screws. On the right we have steel uh, drywall screws or sheetrock screws, which uh, uh, the ones on the left are used quite a bit for uh, furniture or boat building, where the, the material, because it's bronze, it will resist corrosion. And they are intended to go into wood. On the right, uh, they're intended to go in the wood as well, uh, specifically in construction of, of houses where they use uh, a wood frame and you would fasten the, the pieces of wood together with these screws. You would also use the shorter screws to fasten uh, drywall or some sort of wall panel to the wood itself. So here's a picture of uh, using screws to fasten uh, softwood. Uh, and a softwood means uh, a, a, typically a fast growing wood like a pine or spruce and they're soft enough so that they uh, can uh, you can send a screw in without having to drill it first and um, if you do it right it won't uh, it won't split the wood if you move into hardwoods however you do need to drill first because the woods are just too hard to um, to put the screws in without um, a great deal of effort and and poor results so you drew you drill the wood first and uh, on the, the left hand image there you can see it shows an example of, of that where there's countersinking up on the top, meaning uh, a, whore, a, a hole has been bored through the uh, wood on the top piece uh, that, that will allow the screw to go through it tightly, but it'll go through it. And on the bottom, we have uh, drilled just big enough so that the threads can work into the wood and, and attach everything. And moving to the middle image, you can see if you took that one step further and put a counter bore in, drilled everything down a little bit farther, uh, you could put a wood plug on the top of the screw and glue it in place so that the screw itself is, is sheltered from, for instance, uh, salt water if this was going to be a, a boat. And on the right you can see what that hole looks like before you uh, put the fastener in place. Uh, blind threaded fastener types, continuing here. These are for plastic and sheet metal. Uh, in the upper left we have uh, a, a it's a brand name called Plastite and if you look at the end where they have this the letters C and D that shows you a section where the screw itself is not round it's it's it has three lobes on it and it's intended to go into plastic that has not been threaded necessarily and it will um, create the threads by pushing plastic out of the way and then allowing the plastic to return to where it was and that's that locks the thread in uh, moving along the, to the upper right, you have a, um, a form of self-drilling or, or thread uh, cutting screw, and that would go into sheet metal. Uh, and the, the notch cut into the, uh, f the pointy end of the screw actually uh, does a little bit of thread cutting, like uh, in the picture of the tap we saw before. This is a smaller version of that, mostly for sheet metal, uh, but also used for plastics. Uh, just below that, so in the bottom right, you see a self-drilling screw, and on the pointy end of that is actually a, a drill bit. It's a single-use drill bit, and you could just drill right through the pieces of sheet metal uh, that you want to, or plastic that you want to fasten, and it, it sizes everything just right, and once it's done drilling through the material, the threads take over, and this tightens itself right up. On the, the bottom left is an interesting uh, screw. It's actually, uh, it has wood um, threads on the pointy end and up closer to the head where the screwdriver bit goes it has sheet metal screws, the sheet metal threads rather. This is for um, this comes with a with a lock and a doorknob set for uh, by a company named Schlage and they make lots of doorknobs. They got I'm sure sick and tired of, of, of selling 
um, screws f uh, for wood doors and then also uh, uh, including uh, screws for metal doors in the same kit. So they made a screw that works for both wood and metal, which I think is kind of neat. Moving on to blind fasteners that are unthreaded, we have uh, a good example here of pop rivets. Uh, these go through from the top side in this drawing. You would drill a hole through the red and through the white piece of material uh, to the correct size for the rivet. Uh, you pass the rivet through and then using a rivet gun, uh, which you'll see in the next image, the uh, using leverage you pull the, uh, the pin through the center upwards and that compresses everything. Uh, and then it breaks itself off uh, just below the surface after you're done. That's called the arbor and you pull the arbor, it tightens up the rivet, rivet and then when it can't move anymore because the rivet is fully compressed, it breaks itself off. Um, and here is a picture of the rivet gun in use. Uh, and, and this gentleman is going to squeeze the handle on that several times and it will eventually actually pop just like the name suggests. Uh, another example of pop rivets in place here. You see um, this is, it looks like a lock on something, a padlock, right? Well, the, the big fasteners on the left that have the sort of a dark hole in the center of them, those are pop rivets and, and moving along you see that the, the, um, the piece attached to the door has pop rivets and a Phillips head screw or a pair of Phillips head screws holding it as well. Um, Clico clamps are a blind unthreaded fastener. They are not typically used as the uh, finished fastener, but they are used in conjunction with doing anything where you have large panels. In this case, it looks like an airplane wing, and they have to drill and align all the holes up um, individually before they start uh, putting in the, the pop rivets. So you, you get lots and lots of these Clico clamps, and you have a a little wrench, a little pair of pliers that you can put them in place. And um, this is uh, a temporary fastening setup. And once all the holes are drilled and, and the, the operator is satisfied that the piece of sheet metal that they're riveting to this frame has all the correct holes, everything's in the right place, then they can one by one take out these Clico clamps and put in a rivet. Now, the reason why they do that is because if they start riveting right away and they make a mistake, it takes a long time to drill the rivets out uh, without damage anything, damaging anything uh, so that they can start over again. So this is a temporary fastening system that, that uh, can potentially save a lot of time and it allows the piece of uh, work to be removed to be worked somewhere else. Let's say if it needed to be cut or further drilled or sanded or painted, they could get all the holes drilled the way they like it and then remove the Clico clamps and uh, take the piece out to be further processed and then put it back in place and all the holes would be where they needed to be. Uh, one of our uh, most ubiquitous and probably one of the first types of uh, fasteners uh, is a nail and that is a blind unthreaded fastener type. You don't need to get to the back side of it. You just use a hammer and whack it into whatever you need to fasten. Uh, usually fastening multiple pieces together. This is very common for wood um, and um, and other things as well. Sometimes you can fasten through a material and into concrete or masonry, for instance, with a nail. And <clears throat> the nails are not just for uh, uh, building houses uh, one, one at a time. They are also used in production. Here is a, uh, a picture of a, of a regular shipping pallet being um, nailed together with uh, what looks like a regular handheld uh, nail gun that you might find on a construction site. It just this one happens to be fastened. Uh, it's um, controlled by a robot arm to uh, to put together the, the pallet. We move on to our next category of through fasteners. Now, blind fasteners, as I mentioned, uh, you can't you don't have access to the far side of the fastener. Uh, with through fasteners, you do. You have uh, access to both sides. So here's an example. Of, uh, of something here where we have um, two types of fasteners. We have uh, rivets uh, that are along the outside edge of the green steel beam and you also see uh, nuts and bolts which are also fastening that together. Now the reason why they would have both of these in one 
in one piece is because they uh, probably did not have access uh, to the uh, to the backside of the of the piece uh, when they made some of it, or uh, and in, in some cases they they wanted to be able to remove the uh, the nuts and bolts at some point to either service the piece uh, or to um, uh, to make it easier to repair in the future. Uh, another example of through threaded fastener types, we have this pipeline here being held by nuts and bolts, which are uh, go right through that flange and are attached at either side. And here is the ubiquitous, uh, ubiquitous nut and bolt. Uh, this is also showing washers uh, as well, and this is a, an extremely common way to fasten objects together, uh, made out of all, almost any material. You can figure out a way to do nuts and bolts. Um, so moving on, we have uh, through threaded fastener types. Uh, these are binding bolts. Um, they are similar to the nuts and bolts we just saw, except that um, the threads, if you need the, let's say if you're binding together uh, paper, these, these are, uh, or to make a book, this, this is why they're called binding bolts. You can bind paper together to make some sort of book with these, and you can get them so that the threads uh, are completely covered inside one of these nuts, so that the threads won't uh, run the risk of tearing the paper. Uh, another type of uh, through threaded fastener type is, uh, uh, these are called speed nuts. These are used uh, a lot in, uh, in automotive and machinery where you have to fasten things together but you still need a little bit of wiggle room um, because things aren't exactly lined up perhaps or, or uh, the, the tolerances for having, things everything, uh, having everything lined up are not exactly there. So uh, you see um, the, the speed nut there on, in the sort of upper center where the, it has a, a, a screw through it, um, that is itself, the speed nut is sitting in a large oval hole and it can be moved around inside that hole to give you uh, the, uh, the wiggle room that I talked about. Let's say if it was going to fasten a piece of sheet metal over that, uh, you wouldn't uh, have to get, you wouldn't have to build it perfectly exactly right in order to have it um, in order to have the, the screw go through the hole and find the nut on the other side, because the nut is movable. And as soon as you tighten everything up, the, the nut uh, actually won't move around that much. Another type uh, of, of nut is T-nuts. Um, these are, uh, the selection you see here, uh, are largely um, for putting into wood or metal or plastic, uh, where, um, where you have access to uh, both sides so that you can have a, a flush mounted threaded fastening system uh, especially through uh, something that is hard to thread otherwise like wood or plastic. Here's an example of one of our T-nuts in wood. Uh, you can see uh, one on the left is, it has, you can see it's got the sharp teeth on it uh, and you, you would drill a hole and um, send it into the piece of wood as you can see on the right and you see the threads in the middle and you see how the the barbs, the, the teeth, might sink into the wood to keep it from <clears throat> spinning. The uh, In this case, the screw or fastener would come in from the side that you can't see, so it would come in from the bottom, and as it tightens up, it'll draw that T-nut into the wood and, and uh, tighten it so that it won't come out. Here are some uh, T-nuts that are have been welded to a piece of sheet metal. Uh, so they would be called weld nuts. Uh, they are um, made in a, a very similar way to how they would make regular nuts that aren't intended to be welded, except these would be, uh, they would not have any sort of plating on them, like chrome plating or zinc plating, because that would affect the weld. Uh, and it, it uh, these might be made out of a, a different, a slightly different type of steel that is intended for welding. Uh, yet another uh, type of fasteners that, that we're looking at here today, this is called a standoff. These are used a lot in uh, with electronic boards to, uh, uh, in fact, stand them off of something. And you can see our example here, there's a steel bar that runs through the bottom of the, of the image. And the green uh, electronics board is being held off of that steel bar by using a series of uh, standoffs, and they're the, uh, these, uh, as you would expect, come in multiple sizes and materials and types uh, for whatever you need to uh, to stand off of. 
Um, another interesting type, uh, I like this because uh, it reminds me of my race car days. It is a Zeus fastener, uh, and it is intended for, uh, to give you quick access to, uh, uh, for removing a panel on a car or removing the hood of the car. It is a, um, it just, you can use a, uh, a large coin or a, or a um, specific tool that looks like a rounded screwdriver that goes in there and you just turn it a quarter of a turn and it'll release just like that and to close it again you push it in and turn it the corner turn back and because it's spring loaded it tolerates vibration very well and it gives you very very easy access next category through fasteners unthreaded okay so again the, uh, we have access to both sides because it is a through fastener and uh, these are your unthreaded uh, options for fastening. The first is solid rivets. These um, ultimately do the same job as a pop rivet that we saw earlier, except you'll notice that these are uh, they're called solid, rivet, solid rivets for a reason. They do not have an arbor in them. They do not have the capability to be used uh, to be ins inserted with a, with a pop rivet gun. You need access to both sides. And here is an example of that, a piece of aluminum being uh, pop riveted to uh, another piece of aluminum. Uh, on the upper left, the, the, uh, the apparatus there is a uh, powered rivet gun, although you could easily use a hammer. And um, the item that the person is holding is a buck, and that's just a big heavy mass of probably iron or bronze that is heavy enough and hard enough to um, resist um, the uh, to, to to bend over the rivet head to flatten out the rivet head uh, when the impact uh, from the rivet gun hits it. Uh, so basically, uh, you have a heavy object on either side, and you're squashing the rivet. Uh, pop rivets are here again. These these also work when you have access to both sides. Uh, they're actually easier in some ways to use than the previously described solid rivets because you you can uh, you can do it uh, without um, a lot of tooling and um, in most cases these are strong enough the solid rivets will be a little bit stronger but these are certainly strong enough for most, most applications another uh, non-threaded through fastener uh, this is called a clevis pin uh, the uh, on the left of the clevis pin you see uh, a clip that clip is removable so that you can slide a pin into where it lives. You can capture something and put the pin on the end and it will uh, stay put. Uh, an example of what a clevis pin might do for you is uh, in this instance here we have a an air cylinder, the green thing, uh, operating a, a piston which is the blue thing and the pi the blue thing is being held uh, on one end by the uh, by a, uh, a bracket and the pin that holds them both together is a clevis pin uh, and that that allows for movement and uh, the clevis pin is heavy enough and strong enough to take force um, from the, the blue piston and push it through to the object uh, the other object this actually has three clevis pins here each uh, because the um, uh, the action of pushing this piston moves the motor the, the air motor itself and it moves the uh, the bracket uh, on the left as well Washers, the wonderful world of washers. I know by this point you're struggling to stay awake, but please do. It, it's uh, we're almost done. Um, washers here do uh, a lot of good things for us. Uh, what we're looking at here is flat washers, um, be, as opposed to washers that we'll see in a moment that are not flat. Uh, what these washers are intended to spread the load of the fastener so that, for instance, you don't dent uh, the material that you're you're fastening to. They will protect the surface surface of the, the material you're fastening, so that if you were to to uh, to turn a, a nut or a screw against it, it, it wouldn't scratch that surface. Um, and they also uh, can help prevent uh, the fastener from loosening themselves up. And these washers here you're seeing now specifically are intended to prevent a washer from un, uh, from loosening itself up. And the way they do that. Uh, is uh, there's several ways to do it. Uh, first is uh, the lock washers, the, sp the spring washers 
uh, on the upper left are, are little tiny uh, single turn sections of an actual compression spring and when you screw those down into when you put those through a bolt and then tighten the bolt up you compress the spring and that spring compression creates a tension that uh, keeps everything nice and tight and the, the on the uh, on the right you see uh, two different types of washers that use much smaller little springs the ones uh, some of them look like stars and some of them look like rings with teeth on the inside those little teeth when they come under pressure similar to the spring washer the 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 um, these little teeth will actually take a twist and in so doing uh, load up a spring and keep the uh, keep the fasteners from from uh, loosening up thread topics yay we're on threads okay so the first thing to talk about is thread length some fasteners are fully threaded as you see on the left some are partially threaded as you see on the right uh, and the um, the big difference there is that sometimes you don't want threads to go all the way down the end of the uh, fastener uh, and the reasons for that are, have a lot to do with strength uh, where is um, the the unthreaded portion of the fastener could be quite strong and can be used as uh, uh, a clevis pin sort of like we saw before where it's it's smooth and it's going to take force or maybe it's uh, maybe that unthreaded portion is going to keep some heavy stuff lined up so it goes through two things two pieces of metal with a, in a fairly tight hole and prevents them from wiggling around uh, if if there is any vibration uh, on those uh, on those pieces and it happened to be on a fully threaded bolt uh, the threads might either uh, cause the material to uh, to crack or it might cause the fastener to crack so you have choices and um, you should know that they both exist now here's some uh, a, a definition for you uh, between a bolt a screw and a stud um, you may never need to know this in the real world but some of you will know will need to know this frequently a on the left we start with a bolt and that is typically a nut and a bolt squeezing multiple pieces of material together so the bolt goes all the way through and the threads are exposed on the bottom and that's where the nut is fastened moving to the middle the screw cap screw this is often called a cap screw it, it can be the same actual piece as the bolt but when it's used in this fashion it's typically called a cap screw and that goes through the, uh, the the gray piece of material on the top up near its head and it will fasten into threads on the purple piece uh, moving into the next one we have a stud and that is the the purple piece has threads in it and you um, you have inserted the stud or what, what, so you have a bolt that is um, a full-time resident of this purple piece of material and then you would put the gray piece of material on top of that and then fasten it down with the nut on top uh, okay measurement how do we measure these things well here's two machine screws the only difference is the head on the top you have a a, um, a button head and that is intended to sit on top of the material exposed okay so you measure from the underneath of that head the, the bottom of that head on the on the left over to the end of the screw and down below we have a countersunk flathead screw this called a flathead because uh, the exposed head is flat and you drill a countersink in the material and you see that 82 degrees uh, there that is a very common angle for a countersink and the intention uh, that the int uh, the intended result there has the head of the screw right flush with the surface of whatever it's fastening and you measure those full length from from the, uh, the the far end of the screw all the way to the top of the flat head itself and these are machine screws uh, meaning they're intended to hold together uh, probably metal or plastic bits and this one is a wood screw and this has a different way uh, of defining Certain th it's just a further uh, explanation of how it's defining things. It's a very easy um, illustration to, to explain this on. The shank is the unthreaded portion, and that has a diameter, and typically that is the name of the screw will be 
that shank, shank diameter. So if it's a M5, it'll be a 5 millimeter shank diameter, for example. Uh, and the root diameter has, uh, has to do with the thread sizes. Okay, So uh, the, the root diameter is how big the, the actual structural part of the screw is um, underneath the thread. So the threads have a larger diameter and the root diameter is the, the base of the threads. There are several different um, types of thread pitch. Um, fine and coarse, and you see two of them very clearly illustrated here on, um, on on bolts that are the same size, the same material, and the same diameter. They just have a different thread pitch. On the left is a fine thread pitch. On the right is a coarse thread pitch. Um, in general, a fine pitch on the left will be stronger because that root diameter that we talked about is a larger diameter because the threads don't cut into the bolt as much. Um, these are meant for uh, going into harder materials where the threads can be smaller. Uh, and over on the right we have the coarse threaded bolt and that's uh, more, uh, perhaps more intended for a going into a softer material. Um, and um, it will uh, it will be a little bit less strong just because the root diameter of the um, of the threads is a little bit smaller. And I'm sure you've noticed this, uh, but perhaps you didn't know how to explain it. But threads are handed. There are right hand twist threads and left hand twist threads. Um, right hand threads are extremely common, uh, and left hand threads are extremely uncommon you have to really need a left-handed thread to specify one, um, and whereas right-hand threads are everywhere. Um, the reason why we have right-handed threads goes back to, um, it, it's, very, it's, it's a simple uh, physiology explanation where when, mo since most people are right-handed, when you twist a right-handed fastener, you're using your right hand and the twisting motion engages not just your forearm but your bicep whereas if you were going to twist a left-handed screw with your right hand you are you're turning against your uh, muscle mass and it's more difficult to do so this is a right-handed world we live in even for us left-handers so right-handed through right-handed threads are the standard because um, more people use their right hand to fasten things uh, than their left hand. So we move on to fastener locking. How do you keep these darn things from just popping out? Um, when you're dealing with um, any sort of heavier machinery, cars, uh, or, or um, especially with the metallic things that you're fastening, um, the uh, you can really apply enough tension, you can apply enough torque with your wrench on your fasteners, on your nut and bolt to uh, compress the material that you're working with, compress the two pieces together, and also you're stretching the bolt. Yeah, in, um, in a lot of cases, especially with, uh, like I said, with heavy machinery and, and car, engine th car engines, there is a torque setting for specific fasteners. So if you're looking at your engine, and you see a bolt or a series of bolts that is holding something in place, there's a very good chance that that bolt was put in at a very specific torque measurement, uh, either in newton meters or in foot pounds, because that stretches the bolt just a little bit, and that stretch allows um, that that stretch gives it tension and it prevents it from turning itself out. Uh, another way to keep things in place is just good old friction. Um, the, um, on the l uh, left you see a hammer pulling out a nail. Anybody who's ever pulled a nail out of a piece of wood with a hammer knows that there's a great deal of friction involved um, because it's hard to take out. And on the right uh, you see a screw uh, into a fastening two pieces of wood and there's also a great deal of friction in there as well. Uh, when we're doing uh, plastic fastening, 
Uh, typically, we use a, a three-lobed forming screw, the way I, I, talked, I talked about it earlier. The, uh, the lobes are little sharp points, and they go and they um, press into the plastic as you're, as you're driving the screw into the plastic. And once the plastic, uh, once you've stopped moving the screw, once you've stopped fastening it, um, the, um, the plastic sort of uh, goes back to where it used to be. Uh, and in all the places that it can, and that locks those three lobes in place. I dem I've showed you um, lock washers before, but here's a good picture of one right before somebody has tightened it up. You can see there that the, um, the bolt is going through this piece of plastic. Uh, there's a washer uh, against the piece of plastic to protect everything and to spread the load. The next thing up is that little spring lock washer and the nut just above it, once it's tightened up, it will flatten that out so that it just looks like another washer, a flat washer. And that tension will keep the bolt, keep the nuts rather, from coming off. Here are some more mechanical methods of keeping fasteners in place. On the left, we see a cotter pin going through the nut and through the, uh, this looks like a spindle or an axle, so you've got a, a regular nut that has been castellated, meaning it's been turned into a little castle by having these slots uh, machined in the side of it. And those slots line up with the hole in the shaft of the axle there for the cotter pin. And that the cotter pin, then you would bend the ends over. It would has, has not yet been done. Um, right up top, you just hit it with a hammer or, or separate them with a screwdriver, and that would prevent the nut from turning. On the upper uh, upper right there, we have uh, these are nylon locking uh, nuts, and you can see just inside the 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 one on the left. Here you see that little blue ring. That's uh, a little piece of plastic that is a smaller diameter than the uh, screw that you're going to put this nut onto. And because it's uh, a smaller diameter, it's going to you're going to have to force the screw through it, and that friction will keep those nuts in place. Down on the bottom right is. Uh, a way they used to do things before they had all these fancy nylon locking nuts. Uh, it's it's safety wire. The nut itself, the cap screw in this case, is uh, sorry is um, drilled through. You send a piece of stainless steel wire through it, and you twist it up, and uh, that wire itself will keep the nut from um, from backing off. And this is used quite a lot in. Um, uh, aircraft industry where they have to make sure things don't come apart. Another way to uh, fasten threads to make sure they don't come apart is uh, with a thread locking compound and it is uh, sort of like a, uh, a rubberized glue that um, comes in varying strengths and is f um, different compounds for different materials. Uh, on the left you can see uh, somebody putting uh, liquid thread uh, locker onto a, a screw right before they uh, screw it into something. Um, some of the uh, thread lockers are uh, easily removable, uh, so they they'll be on the weak side. Some of them are uh, what they call permanent, which means uh, they're going to be very difficult to get out. Uh, so you want to choose these wisely. Um, on the right, you're looking at fasteners that already have, from the factory, a thread locking compound uh, sprayed onto them and or dipped or something uh, and then it's uh, it's it's been allowed to dry before it was packaged and, and shipped to you uh, so it they work the same way uh, with the um, the ones on the right that, that will be a little bit tougher to, to send into the hole because the thread locker is already uh, dry and it's already offering resistance right off the bat whereas the liquid stuff on the left uh, will be uh, a little bit easier to screw in and uh, because it takes time for the uh, for the glue to dry. Okay, moving along to head types. The head is the top of the fastener uh, and it has um, typically that's where the uh, the connection is to whatever you're using to drive these things in. Uh, we start at the top left. You see a, a flat head screw with a um, Phillips head uh, screwdriver um, uh, fitting. 
Uh, so, and just next to that is, is a, an oval head screw that also has a Phillips head and, and on and on and on. Uh, the second row on the left, you see a, a, a screw uh, that has a, um, a, a slotted head in it for a, a flat bladed screwdriver. Then moving on, you see various types of hex heads, uh, w which you can tighten up or loosen up with a, a wrench uh, or a socket, or, or in, in many cases, um, if you're doing something automated or, or um, in, a, in a factory setting, uh, you're going to use something like one of these hex heads in the middle or down on the bottom row with a, with a, um, a socket or a hex head key or an Allen, you've probably heard it called an Allen uh, wrench, uh, just a hexagonal uh, steel uh, bar with a bend in it and that will fit into there. Okay, the next slide is showing us even more head types uh, and, and, connect, uh, and different drive types. Um, some of them you will uh, no doubt see in your career, and some of them are so specific that you might never see them at all. Um, there, there's just a, a whole world of these, uh, so that you should just keep in mind that if you have uh, very specific or what you consider unusual uh, specifications for your, your fastener or requirements for your fastener, there's probably somebody else who had the same requirements and has developed a fastener type with a with a the drive setup for what you need. So look around and you'll find all kinds of things out there from uh, security uh, keys where where it, you you need to get a very specific wrench to open to to take the screw out so that uh, your your product becomes either tamper proof or or theft proof or something like that. Uh, there's also a bunch of these uh, types of fasteners that do not need tools at all. On the left you see a wing nut and you can see where the threads are there. You spin this down onto your bolt or, or your screw uh, and then just tighten it up with your fingers. Similarly on the, uh, on the right <clears throat> we have a, a thumb screw uh, with a knurled grip so that you can use your fingers to tighten things up. And these, uh, perhaps uh, it's obvious, but these are to be used when there really isn't a whole lot of force required to, um, to keep something fastened together. We move on now into materials. Screws and um, fasteners, uh, everything, they, they, there's so many different materials available um, that um, the best way to, to comb through it is with a basic overview of the, of the ones that I'm going to show you here and then with, with your own understanding of what your needs might be for a specific project uh, and you can um, either become an expert on this or talk to a, an engineer who might be and determine what material works best for you uh, and then find a fastener uh, that's made out of that material. It's such a huge world, this whole world of fasteners, that um, uh, scratching a little bit below the surface uh, is, is going to um, produce a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of knowledge on your part. You'll, you'll learn, uh, you'll go down your own particular little um, down-selected rabbit hole of fasteners and, and you learn a great deal. Um, you see a, a wide variety in this picture of different materials which we'll, we'll go through uh, most of them. First is just regular old steel, uncoated. This steel looks black but that's because um, that's a, a sort of a, a byproduct of processing hot steel which is what this was probably when, when they made it. They, they would stamp and roll this out and then the black is just a leftover uh, fitting uh, finish from, from, from that process. Steel is cheap, it's strong, uh, it's probably available all the way around the world, uh, and it's um, so it, it's well known, okay, and it, it also has an issue with rust, but that can be uh, that can be accommodated for as well. Um, stainless steel does not have the same issue with corrosion and rust. Uh, it does discolor and eventually uh, you know, it will eventually rust out uh, much, much, much slower than steel, but that's only because um, there's there's a tiny little bit of rustable material in stainless, and not that much. Different alloys of stainless steel have more or less uh, of the of the uh, material that rusts in it, so you can decide what you need. Uh, um, everything's a trade-off on on the. Uh, on the side that's uh, of the, the spectrum of materials that is stronger in stainless steel. Uh, it has a little bit more iron in it, so that rusts a little bit more. But on the 
Likewise, on, on the end of the spectrum that doesn't rust, that really stays truly stainless, it's not quite as strong. So you have to pick and choose what you really need from your stainless steel fastener. Uh, stainless steel is not quite as strong as good old steel, uh, but it's pretty strong and they're, they're ubiquitous enough so that they are relatively cheap. Um, more expensive than steel, certainly, but not, not unaffordable. Another good uh, option to consider is aluminum. Uh, there's all kinds of fasteners made out of aluminum. Uh, lower strength, but also um, much lower weight, and um, also uh, different corrosion uh, properties. So in, in certain environments, they really won't corrode at all. Uh, next is brass. Uh, you get that beautiful, rich, uh, yellow-orange color from brass. Brass, um, there's lots of different fixtures and fittings made out of brass because it's very easy to machine. Uh, and it is uh, it resists corrosion quite well. Um, they've been, uh, um, especially in the early Industrial Revolution, they used to make a lot of stuff out of brass um, because of the, the corrosion and because it was easy to machine. So there's... there's um, in this category as well could be bronze, which is, um, I think, brass and copper alloyed together. I'm not sure. Uh, but th there's um, a pretty wide range of types of brass from things that are easy to machine all the way, uh, and, and on the other side might be things that are very strong, uh, or items that are uh, parts of uh, types of brass that are very strong. Plastic fasteners. If you open up any car and look in the interior, you're going to see a handful of different plastic fasteners and they're just holding on uh, let's say they're holding on the, the uh, upholstered trim that um, attaches to the inside of the car or maybe they're holding pieces of the dashboard together uh, they are very light they're uh, they're cheap to make they are mostly designed to ease the assembly of the vehicle and to hold strong enough so that um, they won't uh, they won't come apart during the normal use of a vehicle now what do we do about our friend rust? Here's a bolt that um, has not been able to avoid rust. There are options on treating uh, and coating steel, regular uh, full steel, right? Uh, on the left here we see um, galvanized plating. Um, that is uh, a zinc coating uh, that, that's put on in, in, a, um, as in an electro galvanizing bath kind of thing. There's, um, th there's this, a pretty full spectrum of, of galvanizing from the very best, the most expensive, which is full hot tip galvanizing, all the way down to um, electroplating of zinc, which is done uh, at much colder temperatures and is a much thinner coating. Uh, next on the list here uh, is, is phosphate, uh, and then there's Teflon, and then Xylon. These are all um, intended to resist specific uh, threats, either from the environment or the chemicals that they're around or what have you. This, um, to, to truly understand what, what all these do, you, you should uh, know what th uh, threats and hazards your product is going to face and then do a little research or find an engineer or become an engineer on uh, the who knows how to spec what kind of uh, coating and protection your, your fasteners need. Uh, moving along, you see the zinc plating that, that uh, is um, as opposed to the hot tip galvanized at the uh, at the far left, and then there's there's cadmium plating. A lot of things that you see on the inside of a car uh, or inside of a computer, if they look a little bit yellowish like that, they are cadmium plated. That uh, that gives you a uh, a moderate resistance to um, to corrosion. Chrome plating is in there as well. That's uh, um, I guess true chrome plating is you actually coat steel with three different metals, the last one being chromium. Uh, so because of that, it's, uh, it's falling out of favor as a decorative um, feature for things like car bumpers, simply because chrome plating is not terribly good for the environment. Um, but if you determine through research that the best thing, the best fastener for your product is chrome plated, then that's certainly fine. Um, next we have ceramic coating. Uh, these, uh, this is a picture of, of um, screws that are intended to hold together uh, a wooden deck that you would have uh, outside your house. Um, and they are ceramic coated. Uh, I don't know the process, but this is regular steel. Um, and uh, they are 
uh, color coded for um, I guess the material that they go in, whether they so they can maybe match up a little bit better. Um, but they uh, the ceramic coating is is really good at uh, giving you a long term rust free fastener. Some other uh, one more thing to consider here is is um, bimetallic or galvanic corrosion. That's when you have two dissimilar metals, and you have any sort of of moisture uh, interacting between the two of them directly, it becomes a little miniature battery. And whichever of the materials is um, more susceptible to losing electrons, uh, in this case uh, you see an aluminum bar with, uh, with steel bolts that have been put through it. The, um, the combination of the steel and the aluminum with some moisture has turned it into uh, an electric, a very low current electrical circuit. And over time, and it's not usually that much time sometimes, it's, uh, it will corrode all of the weaker metal away until you have a, a failure. This happens a lot on boats because salt water uh, is very good at helping to corrode uh, these, uh, these two metals. Uh, anyway, th you should consider this at least whenever you're putting two dissimilar metals together do a little research, see if your two metals will uh, react in the environment that you're choosing. If you're talking about an interior, inside the house product that will never see water, then it, you, you're probably, uh, you don't have to worry about it too much. If it's an outdoor product that's going to get rained on, uh, and especially if it has something to do with an automobile, in, uh, in a northern climate where they uh, put salt on the roads, for instance, or perhaps uh, in a uh, in an environment near salt water, uh, on a on a boat or a vehicle or a desalination plant, you're going to really have to know about all this stuff. So I thank you very much. Um, I hope you've learned something, and uh, I hope you remember this, uh, because in class we'll be doing a um, a mix and match uh, of various uh, fasteners. Thank you very much.